It is now time for question period. The member from Renfrew, Nicholson, Pember. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, we've been talking a lot lately about this upcoming sale of shares in Hydro One, but there's been very little talk of your sale of Hydro One Brampton. Ed Clark's report states that a deal has already been reached with three private companies. Yet your government never publicly put Hydro One Brampton up for sale. You never even asked for a single competitive bid. Ontarians have no guarantee that they're getting maximum value for the sale of Hydro One Brampton. Premier, if you're going to sell public assets, can you at least provide some evidence that it's being done properly? Mr. Speaker, I know, the Minister of Energy, I know the Minister of Energy is going to want to comment in the supplementaries, but I, I, just, want to, uh, I just want to be clear, Mr. Speaker, that um, I believe that uh, it is very important that we work with uh, local distribution companies in this province, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I think consolidation is something that we can agree is, uh, is an important thing. The, uh, the proposed merger of Enersource, Horizon, Hydro One, Brampton and PowerStream will create the second largest distributor, Mr. Speaker. And this merged entity would be able to deliver efficiencies and economies of scale that would translate into savings, Mr. Speaker, for their respective ratepayers. So that is that is critical. And I would just also comment, Mr. Speaker, that on the agreement that consolidation is a good thing, uh, the PC's white paper, Mr. Speaker, encouraged consolidation, and I quote, for stronger utilities yes, and lower operations, maintenance, and administrative costs, unquote. They actually are inside Thank with you. this, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. I think you said the gas plant cancellation. I think you said you believed the gas plant cancellation was going to be 40 million. Premier, we're talking about alcohol sales. Ed Clark wrote, "We express the view that some degree of competition is always healthy." Yet, when talking about the sale of hydro assets, he wrote, "The council believes that the province should not conduct an open auction or Imagine procurement that. process for Hydro One Brampton. It. It's a classic <laughs> liberal move: say one thing, do another." Uh. Premier, if Ed Clark states competition is always healthy. Why won't you allow a single competitive bid process on, on the sale of Hydro One Brampton? Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, uh, after considerable consultation uh, and examining the market, Mr. Speaker, the council's re order. And like yesterday, I'll jump quickly. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, the Council's report emphasized, quote, Leader this the option results in a strong consolidator in the GTHA at a value that was as high as could otherwise be achieved, and they did explore the market, Mr. Speaker. This proposed merger is a unique circumstance that presented itself, and the Council was of the belief that its value could not be replicated through any alternative process. In considering what form of strategic sale or merger to pursue, Mr. Speaker, the Council was influenced strongly and the importance of creating a strong standalone industry consolidator. And again, Mr. Speaker, their path to prosperity Thank stated. You. Final supplementary. Sure, we'll just trust you on this one, like we've done in the past. Eh? Premier, you're asking Ontarians to trust you on this deal. With your track record, that's just not good enough. <laughs> that's why I wrote to the Auditor General to ask her to investigate the sale yep. of Hydro One Brampton before you remove her ability to do so in the coming weeks with yep. the passing of the budget bill. Yep. Premier, we know you like to say you're open and transparent, so now's your chance to back that up. If you truly have nothing to hide, you will support my request to let the Auditor General, with her vast experience yep. in the energy sector, investigate the sale of Hydro One Brampton. Thank you. Yes, I said that I was going to be sharp, especially when I'm standing. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, the, the transaction represents eight municipalities, some of whom are already uh, uh, consolidated in one form or another, Mr. Speaker. The circumstances were extremely unique. Our government intends to proceed with the merger of Enersource, Horizon, Hydro One Brampton, and PowerStream to ensure value for the province and to encourage local distribution company consolidation for the benefit of ratepayers. Mr. Speaker, they issued a, a white paper. They talked about trying to create circumstances for consolidation. 
consolidation. They issued a white paper that asked to broaden the ownership, Mr. Speaker, of Hydro One and OPG, Mr. Speaker. Now they're turning against themselves, Mr. Speaker, only to be critical and have no positive options to offer Answer. in this House, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question. Member from Dixler, Conestoga. My question is to the Premier. Premier, last week's auditor's report revealed the truth of the fatal impact of your decisions to sign cost-cutting substandard contracts for winter road maintenance. And yet, when asked yesterday, you tried to spin a tale suggesting standards after your cost-cutting contracts were the same as before they were signed. You even tried to blame a previous government you know full well had nothing to do with you lowering the bar on standards. Well, that's what she does. The auditor made it clear regarding your government's contracts substituting outcome targets for previously long-held standards. Catch contractors were making it up as they went along. Previous requirements protecting the safety of Ontario motorists went right out the window when you introduced the new agreements. Premier, this is on you. Admit it. Your cost-cutting contracts weren't the result of previous governments. They were Question. about you on and you. yours alone. You and you alone. Minister of Transportation. Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Again, as I said yesterday, I want to thank the member from Kitchener-Conestoga for that question. And as I said last week, Speaker, when the auditor released her report, I thank her and her team for the thorough review that they've conducted into the uh, Ministry of Transportation's winter maintenance program. Speaker, as a result of the 2013 internal review that the ministry conducted on this program, we have brought forward over 105 pieces of additional equipment, 55 pieces mostly for Northern Ontario and 50 pieces Remember from for, Bruce uh, for Southern Island. Ontario. We brought in 20 additional area inspectors to help enhance the oversight within the program itself. Last week's 2015 Ontario budget included additional measures that, if passed, uh, will help us provide more anti-icing liquid through our contractors Answer. as needed, as well as additional unique spreaders for sand and salt both for northern areas and congested urban areas, Speaker. Thank you very Thank much. You. Good. Good. Back to the Premier. Premier, apparently you just can't handle the truth, even after the auditor spelled it out in black and white. After years of rhetoric and doublespeak by an endless line of transportation ministers, from Jim Bradley to Kathleen Wynne to Bob Shirelli to Glenn Murray, the report details a road management scheme that you passed around like a hot potato all the while jeopardizing Ontario motorists. Four separate ministers, and now a rookie fifth, will, are willing to turn their heads while contracts you signed ensured substandard maintenance on winter roads, leading to injuries and even death. You all signed these contracts. People have lost loved ones as a result. You are all implicated, and yet you keep talking about a too-little, too-late review that's not even public yet. Premier, quit the game playing, the finger pointing, and own up to the truths the auditor has revealed. This will be my last reminder about this today, and that is you use members' uh, writings or their titles, and that's it. Thanks very much, Speaker, and I thank the member for that question. As I also mentioned last week, both in response directly to the auditor's report, but also in response to questions that occurred here in the legislature, Speaker. Amongst all of the eight recommendations and all of the background information that the auditor provided, and by the way, Speaker, the Ministry of Transportation and I, as Minister of Transportation, accept all eight of the auditor's recommendations, and we'll be moving forward to make sure that we continue to provide uh, the, uh, the service that's required. But, Speaker, Remember amongst all Niagara of those Falls. recommendations, the auditor did acknowledge that the province of Ontario for the last 13 years has consistently ranked first or second in North America when it comes to highway safety. And in fact, Speaker, Member from Renfrew, and, in fact, Speaker, and in fact, Speaker, specifically in 2012, the only other jurisdiction in North America that had a better, better record than Ontario was in fact, Speaker, the District of Columbia. So, yes, Speaker, it doesn't mean that our work is done. The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke, second time. One wrap up sentence, please, sir. It doesn't mean that the work is done. It's why I said very clearly last week I accept full responsibility for going forward. I will work with our area maintenance contractors, and we will make sure the program continues to provide the, ex the, the service that the people of Ontario Answer. deserve. Thank you. Thank you very much. The 2013 report shortly. 
Premier, the fact is that the auditor report only paints part of the picture. That picture becomes darker still when you consider the fatalities that continue to mark Ontario highways while government turns the other way. Carol Milokovic wonders if her husband Robert and her son Daniel would still be alive today following a fatal collision with a transport truck on February 3rd on a stretch of highway near Cornwall, many considered a winter trouble spot. Premier, we have a growing death toll, lawsuits, a damning auditor's report, and instead of apologies and action, these families get platitudes to future fixes. Premier, quit saving money on the backs of Ontario motorists. Apologize and make damn sure your winner made decisions. Don't jeopardize the lives of Ontario motorists. The member will withdraw. Thank you, much, uh, Speaker. You know, Speaker, when I when I spoke last week in response to the auditor's report, I did say, and I'll repeat it here this after this morning. Yeah. Speaker, every single day of the week, I use Ontario's yeah. highways, as does my wife, and very often, both of our young daughters are in the car with us. And I know that many on all sides of this house. I do the exact same thing. So, Speaker, I feel profoundly a sense of responsibility with respect to making sure that going forward, we continue to bring the improvements that are required to the winter maintenance program to provide, as I said earlier, that level of service that the people of Ontario deserve. Speaker, I should also say that I have specifically written to the auditor um, with respect to asking her to come back in from at the North. end of next winter season, so at the end of winter 2015-2016 to provide the Ministry of Transportation and the media and the public at large with an update with respect to our progress, Speaker. That's real accountability. We're going to keep working on this program, Answer. and we'll have that report next year. Thanks very much. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The Premier is selling off Hydro One without even asking Ontarians what they think. And instead of hearing from them as part of the budget process, she's keeping everything on lockdown here in Toronto. Why isn't the Premier interested, Speaker, in hearing from people across Ontario about, Ontario about her decision to sell off their Hydro One? Thank you, Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I as I, uh, as I remarked yesterday, we are having uh, more hearings on our budget, Mr. Speaker, Not than the, the history of uh, the leader. other uh, two parties would demonstrate, Mr. Speaker. We've increased the number of days of hearings, and I think the member opposite knows that people from around the province can uh, can delegate to uh, to the budget uh, uh, committee, Mr. Speaker. They can they can provide information. They can either in written or in person, in written form or in person, they can uh, provide information. So, Mr. Speaker, quite the opposite of what the, uh, the member opposite is suggesting. We are interested in hearing from people on the, uh, the plan that we have put forward in the budget, Mr. Speaker. A plan I might, I might say we ran on, Mr. Speaker, and we, uh, we have put into our budget. We ran on reviewing our assets. Thank you very Thank much, you. Mr. Speaker. Speaker, while the Premier won't listen to Ontarians, we know she will listen to high-priced consultants here, about here. what they think about selling Hydro One. And while she's paid nearly $7 million to high-priced consultants, she won't tell Ontarians what they gave her in terms of advice. Now, I think there are some other people she should be consulting with, Speaker. The people who actually own Hydro One and the people who pay the bills, Speaker. This might surprise the Premier, but Hydro One doesn't belong to the Liberal Party. It belongs to Ontarians. Now, can the Premier explain, Speaker, why it is that she paid $7 million to get advice from Bay Street consulting firms, but she won't consult with the people of Ontario about the sale of Question. their Hydro One? Thank you. Well, Thank you. Mr. Speaker, once again, let me just let me just challenge the leader of the third party by reminding her that uh, there has been a proposal presented to both opposition House leaders that would increase the standard for committee consideration to six days. And let's remember what, when she was in when their party was in office in 91 to 92, there was one day of committee hearing, Mr. Speaker, under the PCs from, two, from 1996 to 2002, Mr. Speaker. Remember from Simcoe North will come to order second time.
Mr. Speaker, two days of hearings, 1997, two days, 2000, two days, 2002, zero days of committee hearings, Mr. Speaker. So the fact is that we are going to be Answer. hearing from the people of Ontario. But Mr. Speaker, to the point about having experts give us advice, it was a complicated process, Mr. Speaker, Thank and you. we did have experts. Thank you. This is not enough time for Ontarians to have their say on one of the biggest public policy decisions that have co has come through this chamber in a decade or more. It is not right, Speaker. It is wrong. She is treating the sell-off of Hydro One like it was a done deal. That's what the point of privilege was about this morning. To those of you in the back benches, uh, you just have to remember this. It is you that is going to have to go to your constituents and explain why your Premier is putting this through the Legislature without talking to Order. Order. The uh, Minister of Economic Development. Not now from the member from Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. As part of the convention, if comments and questions are put to the speaker, we tend not to have this. Please finish. Well, Speaker, it's not just me saying this. Almost 25,000 Ontarians have sent the message to the Premier through our website. Even Liberal riding activists are launching campaigns to stop their very own Premier from this wrong-headed decision. Now, can she explain? Can she explain to Ontario families why it is that she will not take the time to listen Thank to them you. and give them the respect they deserve? Well, Mr. Speaker. What I will say to uh, to the leader of the third party and to the people Member of Ontario, from Hamilton we, East Stony we Creek. are very interested in their comments, Mr. Speaker. I am very interested in hearing from them, as we did in pre-budget hearings around the province, Mr. He Mr. Speaker. I'm very interested in hearing their responses on the budget, which is why we have increased the number of days that uh, that we would like to have uh, uh, post-budget hearings, Mr. Speaker. But. Mr. Speaker, a couple of things that the leader of the third party has said are very indicative of what she's trying to do at this moment. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we have had very clear discussions in the lead-up to the budget about what was in that budget. We are a team that has taken this budget to the people of the province, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. It may be that the way the third party works, Mr. Speaker, is that it's a one-woman show, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. That's not how it works over here, Mr. Speaker. We actually have a a combined approach that we are Thank you. Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Start the clock. Order. New question, the leader of the third party. It's for the Premier Speaker. The Premier says that selling Hydro One is the only way to pay for transit and infrastructure. But she's just given away the very first shares in Hydro One, and it won't put a nickel into infrastructure or transit. The, the Premier says Andrew selling off Hydro Morris. One is the only way. New Democrats say it is the wrong way. The Premier does not have other options. But she, she rather she does have other options, but she refuses to look at them. Things like corporate taxes, Speaker. Things like closing HST loopholes or keeping the billions of dollars. Stop the clock, please. The uh, Minister of Energy, come to order. The Minister of Economic Development, the member from Trinity Spadina. I'm catching up. You can laugh all you want. I do know who is. Please finish. 
or speaker, keeping the billions of dollars in long-term stable revenue that Hydro One brings to fund all of our services here in this province. The Premier says selling Hydro One is the only choice, but she is glossing over the fact that it will pay for only 3 per cent of her $130 billion in promises. Will the Premier explain why it is she's ramming through a plan to sell Hydro One, a plan that isn't needed for transit and infrastructure, Thank but you. does leave families paying the Thank price? You. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, um, let's just be clear that what the leader of the third party wants to do now is once again block the implementation of a budget, Mr. Speaker, that Number would, Essex, that would build new transit, that would, would continue to reduce auto rates, Mr. Speaker, that would continue to implement an Ontario retirement pension plan. She, she's not interested in doing any of those things, Mr. Speaker, and she's not putting a plan forward for how she would make the no investments plan. in infrastructure, $130 billion, Mr. Speaker, over 10 years. And she knows perfectly well that in order to make that investment, order. there are a number of things that we have to do. She knows perfectly well, Mr. Speaker, that we have allocated HST and gas tax, Mr. Speaker, to put towards those investments. She knows perfectly well, Mr. Speaker, that the, uh, the opening of ownership of Hydro One is only one part of that plan, Mr. Speaker, and it is a plan to make investments that Thank she you. apparently is not interested in making. Speaker, the Premier does not have a mandate to sell Hydro One, and that is the bottom line. She does not have a good reason to sell Hydro One. Sure, it'll make a handful of high-paid consultants, Bay Street bankers and Liberal insiders very, very rich, Speaker, but Minister it will leave families paying higher bills for generations to come. The Premier didn't give people a say on this during the election because no matter how hard she protests, she didn't run on it and everybody knows it. There is uh, some back and forth going on while a question is being put by members of that side and there are members, uh, while the answer is being put, dialoguing, trying to egg each other on. I get it. I hope you get it, that it's not supposed to happen. Did you wrap up? Please. No matter how hard she protests, Speaker, she knows darn well she did not run on this plan, and everybody Answer. knows it. Now she's ramming it through the House. Why is the Premier ramming, ramming through a plan that's bad for Ontarians Thank without you. even asking them what they think? You. Well, Mr. Speaker, you know, I would, uh, I would say to the leader of the third party, what is it about making investments in this province to the tune of $130 billion for the next 10 years, Mr. Speaker, that investing in transit and Member transportation infrastructure, and by that I mean roads and bridges across this province, Mr. And Speaker. James Why Bay. is it that she does not see that that is necessary to the economic health and well-being of this province, Mr. Right. Speaker? We ran on this. We said we were going to make those investments, and we said that part of our plan, Mr. Speaker, was to review the assets that were owned by the people of Ontario and make sure that we could leverage them to have the uh, ability to invest in the infrastructure structure and the assets that are needed for the 21st century, Mr. Speaker. Answer. We ran on that. She ran on that, Mr. Speaker. We are implementing the plan that we ran Thank on. You. Uh, I don't Speaker, what is it about actually getting a mandate from the people in a democracy that this Premier does not understand? Uh, absolutely. The Premier did not get a mandate to sell off Hydro One. That is the truth. Stop the clock. There are a few people that are on two. Please finish. Thing is, Speaker, now that she has an opportunity to get input through the committee process, instead she's going to ram it through the House. She is not interested in what people have to say. Instead, she's pu pushing for a privatization agenda that is worse than that of what we saw with Ernie Eves and Mike Harris. Now, will the Premier stop listening to bankers? Stop listening.
Please finish. Will the Premier stop listening to bankers, stop listening to high-paid consultants, stop listening to Liberal insiders, and start listening to the people of Ontario Thank and you. give them a chance to have their say Thank and you. put a stop to this wrong? Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, let me just remind the uh, leader of the third party of uh, the text of our uh, 2014 budget, and I quote, the government will look at maximizing and unlocking value from assets it currently holds, including real estate holdings, as well as crown corporations such as Ontario Power Generation, leader of the third party Electric come to Control order. Board of Ontario, unquote. And Mr. Speaker, we said in, the, in, our, in our 2014 platform, and I quote, our Moving Ontario Forward plan includes a balanced and responsible approach to paying for these investments. The funds will be dedicated from sources of revenue. Asset optimization, we pegged at $3.15 billion or 10.9 percent, Mr. Speaker. That's what we ran on. But underlying that, Mr. Speaker, was a plan to make the investments that we yes, know sir. are needed in this province that will allow this economy to grow, Mr. Speaker. She doesn't want to talk to experts. The Thank leader you. of the third party is not interested yes. in making. Thank you. Your question, the member from Charlton Kent Essex. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Community uh, Safety and Correctional Services. Uh, we have known for over a year that your ministry has been gearing up for strike. You started building strike accommodations 10 months before the corrections contracts had even ended, a clear sign that you aren't planning to bargain in good faith. This past week, we learned those buildings cost $5.8 million. Dollars. For a government that is selling everything they can to pay their debts, that money could have gone a long ways elsewhere. Minister, almost every ministry is slashing frontline services. Minister, bargain in good faith. Wouldn't that $5.8 million have been better spent on correctional frontline services? Thank you. Minister, Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for asking the question. I am sure, as Speaker, also the member opposite knows that when it comes to matters dealing with collective bargaining, it will be highly inappropriate for anybody in this House to speak to that. I think, uh, Speaker, we at this side of the House firmly believe uh, that the best place uh, for bargaining to take place uh, is at, at the table uh, between our, our labor partners uh, and, and, and the management. And uh, I really urge the, the member that I, we should not interfere uh, in that uh, bargaining process. I have uh, utmost respect for the process. I, I know, uh, Speaker, that uh, negotiations are ongoing, and I will not interfere in those negotiations. Thank, Thank you. you. Supplementary. Well, well, Minister, I'm not so certain that I really got an answer to this. Those $5.8 million were spent 10 months before contracts even ended. Meanwhile, you allowed new super jails in Toronto and Windsor to operate for a year without infirmaries, while facilities like the Elgin Middlesex Detention Centre are overcrowded and understaffed. This is inexcusable, yet you would rather pour— Stop the clock. Stop the clock. I would ask that the, um, uh, the crowd not engage in any activities that are disruptive to the House. Sergeant at Arms. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Speaker. So we were talking about uh, operating a year without infirmaries while facilities in Elgin Middlesex Detention Centre are overcrowded and understaffed. It's unexcusable, yet you would rather pour millions into preparing for a strike that may not happen. Maybe you had the foresight, the foresight that students across the province would be out of classroom because your colleague refuses to negotiate. The foresight that correctional institutions would strike Question. next. Clearly, Minister, you have no hope of getting a deal done. Minister, is that $5.8 million part of your Thank net you. zero deals? Or will Thank you. Thank you. Time. Minister. Uh, speaker, again, I, I would restate uh, that uh, uh, we respect the collective bargaining process and we let uh, uh, the bargaining to take place uh, uh, at the Member table from between, uh, between our, our Labour partners and, and uh, between the management. I think it's not appropriate for any member to engage uh, in, in that process here uh, in the House. So also, Speaker, I want to, to note the fact that uh, our number one priority is the health and safety of our correctional staff, which includes our correctional uh, officers and that of the 
teammate. Uh, when you are engaged in the collective bargaining and dealing with uh, inst uh, places like a correctional institution speaker, it will be highly uh, 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 irresponsible for any government to not en uh, engage in uh, some Answer. planning uh, ahead of time to ensure that the health and safety of all correctional staff um, and inmates is protected at all times. Good. New question. A member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. The Premier hasn't even passed her budget bill yet, but she's already handing away shares of Hydro One worth tens of millions of dollars a year and hundreds of millions of dollars over the lifetime of that deal, all without ever asking Ontarians. The Premier promised all the money from Hydro One would go to transit and infrastructure, but those hundreds of millions of dollars that the Premier is giving away won't build any bridges, won't pave any roads, won't dig any subway tunnels, and she's doing it all before her budget has even been passed. Does the Premier think that her decisions trump the will of the Legislature? Thank you. Premier? Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, the uh, critic for the NDP knows, uh, in fact, that there is a tentative agreement and that we cannot discuss or disclose those, uh, those details, Mr. Speaker, until there's been a ratification vote. But, Mr. Speaker, it's time, Mr. Speaker. The GTA has the worst congestion of any municipal area in the world, Mr. Speaker. The City of Hamilton needs funding, Mr. Speaker. The City of Hamilton needs funding for its rapid transit, Mr. Speaker. Rural communities have been asking to expand natural gas, Mr. Speaker. The proceeds of sale, proceeds of, uh, of uh, sharing ownership of Hydro One, Mr. Speaker, will be invested in infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. And in that process, we're respecting the interests of the ratepayers, uh, Mr. Speaker. They have no plan and of any nature or kind other than they admitted today they are going to tax Answer. to pay for infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, we'll tell the province that. They're going to tax for infrastructure. Thank you. We are going to repurpose our assets. Thank you. Supplementary. Wow. Wow. That's progressive. Wow. Quite a performance. Um, selling Hydro One is the wrong decision. It means that bills will go up and that families will pay the price. Handing away shares will cost hundreds of millions of dollars over the lifetime of the Premier's scheme. That's hundreds of millions of dollars not going to transit or infrastructure that the Minister just spoke about. The Premier is handing away hundreds of millions of dollars in Hydro One shares before the budget has even been passed. Can the Premier explain why she doesn't seem to care about what people have to say? or even waiting until the budget has been, get, been to committee, let alone passed. Mr. Speaker, uh, the opposition continues to say that the ratepayer will pay. We just heard that again, Mr. Speaker. The member knows that the Ontario Energy Board approves all prices that consumers will pay, Mr. Speaker. In fact, there is a record before us over the last Order. six or seven years, Mr. Speaker, where the Ontario Energy Board has, in fact, reduced requests from the existing Hydro One from Ontario Power Generation, reduced them or, or in fact, uh, given them less than they've asked for, Mr. Speaker. It is a process that was established, that was used by all previous governments. They'll continue to be in place for this Hydro One and the next Hydro One and OPG and everybody else who applies for rate increases, Mr. Speaker. They refuse to accept that. They continue to say that it's going to raise prices Answer. for the rate Mr. Speaker, it's not true, Mr. Speaker. It's bull. Stop, stop. The, uh, the member will withdraw. Withdraw, Speaker. Thank you. New question: The member from Etobicoke Centre. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister, yesterday my sister Milena gave birth to a daughter, and. Mother and daughter are healthy, and my brother-in-law, Joel, and my parents, Don and Miroslava, are thrilled to be grandparents. Having seen what my sister has gone through over the past nine months, I know how important it is that women have the support that they need to ensure that they and their children are healthy. Very appropriately, today marks International Day of the Midwife. It's a day to celebrate midwifery and to reflect on the importance of midwives' work uh, to the health, the support to the health of women and babies around the world. 
here in Ontario, women and families embraced midwifery since it was regulated in 1994, and the profession is growing in response to that demand, Mr. Speaker. In this spring, we will see the largest ever uh, class of graduates Question. from the midwifery education program. There are about 760 registered midwives and 30 Aboriginal midwives, Mr. Speaker. Minister, what is our government doing to support the important work being done by midwives across Ontario? Thank you. Very good, Mr. Well, Mr. Speaker, today is International Day of the Midwife, and I want to take this opportunity to thank Ontario's more than 700 midwives practicing in 100 clinics throughout the province for the incredible work that you do as a vital part of Ontario's health care team. But today, Mr. Speaker, I want to specifically thank Katrina Kilroy, Sarah Knox, and Tiffany Hayden, the three midwives from the Midwives Collective of Toronto who were responsible for bringing my son, Reese who will be 10 in a week's time into this world. Mr. Speaker, you see, my wife Sam and I, both of us being medical doctors, we decided to have a home birth, one of the truly best decisions we have ever made. And of course, with two midwives attending our son's birth, I was relegated to the role of coach and water bearer and calming the family dog who was quite upset at the whole commotion. And sir, the sheer joy of being able to deliver Reese at home in a familiar environment and bring him into this world, guided by the professionalism and compassion of talented midwives, is something that we will never forget. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister. And I'm happy to hear about the great investments our government is making, to, uh, is making in midwifery in Ontario. I know that midwifery services are offered at 71 hospitals in Ontario and birthing centres were launched in both Toronto and Ottawa recently. Our government has taken great steps in advancing midwifery in Ontario, but I know also that there is more work to be done. Our government continues to transform our health care system in the province, and I know this transformation is a key element of the 2015 budget. Minister, could you talk about the 2015 budget commitments and the future investment in midwives in Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, Ontario became the first jurisdiction in Canada to regulate midwifery, and since that time, Ontario's midwives have attended more than 180,000 births, including 35,000 home births. And since our government came into office in 2003, funding for the midwifery program has increased almost more than fivefold, from $21 million to $134 million in uh, the last fiscal year. And these investments have led to the doubling of the number of midwives in the province. Now, Canada, rather, Ontario has the majority of registered midwives in all of Canada. But the member from Etobicoke Centre is right. There is more work to be done. Together, working with the Association of Ontario Midwives, our government will be expanding our support to grow the number of Aboriginal midwives in Ontario. We're serious about this commitment. We referenced it in the budget, and we look forward Answer. to launching this important program in the coming months. I'd like to once again thank our midwives for all of their hard work Thank you. and dedication to Ontario families. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for the Minister of Education. <coughs> Minister, you have 72,000 secondary school students out of the classroom right this minute. Your two-tiered train wreck Bill 122 bargaining is simply not working. We have chatted with both sides, and they say there is simply nothing to bargain with. Minister, it is really time for you to get serious. You have a responsibility to the students and to their parents. You have to show leadership and make sure those students who get to attend their proms, their field trips, their sports competitions, and above all, their graduation ceremonies. Minister, time is running out. What are your plans to get serious about this mess, a mess that has been created by 12 years of Liberal mismanagement? Okay. Yes, and uh, I, I just want to repeat that, of course, we know that we need to reach a re uh, negotiated settlement, and we remain quite willing to be at the table and to do just that. But the member um, asked some question about what are we doing to support the students whose teachers are on strike, and uh, in fact, there, one Prince of Edward the Hastings. concerns that we had was around uh, the very highest needs, very vulnerable special education children. So. Uh, the, the kids who would have supports in place from agencies on March break and summer holidays. And uh, Remember for Duffer and Kellen in second time. Very carefully uh, with MCYS, with Minister McCharles and the agencies that support her in each of the three areas where there's a Answer. strike to make sure that the highest needs, most vulnerable students have that Two. support in place during the strike. That's responsible. Please. A member from Leeds Grenville will come to order. 
Supplementary. I asked you to get serious. Minister, next Monday, Halton, Lakehead, Ottawa and Waterloo boards will likely all be out as well. That's another 51,000 wow. students who will not be in the classroom because of your Bill 122, and we call it the two-tiered train wreck of a bargaining system. On top of that, we know that it's highly unlikely that 817,000 elementary students will be impacted negatively beginning next Monday. This is a total of 950,000 students. The system is in turmoil and it's broken. Your ministry has no one to blame except yourself for this mess. When, Minister, are you going to step up, show leadership, and make sure our students are receiving the education they paid for and that they deserve? Thank you. Thank you, yes, and uh, just going back to what are we doing to support students, because that was the original question. Uh, my ministry has been working very carefully with Minister Maridi's uh, ministry, with TCU, with the uh, university and college application centres. All the boards where kids are out uh, because of a strike. Before the strike, the interim uh, marks were submitted. The application process is going on. Of course, we want our kids back in school, and we will work very hard at the bargaining table to make that happen. But I'm not taking any lessons from the people who said they would get rid of 22,700 yes, education workers. Thank you. New question, the member from Welland. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Secondary educators in Peel, Rainbow, and Durham school districts are now on strike. The Elementary uh, Teachers Federation of Ontario members are pose, poised to begin their job action on Monday. Meanwhile, uh, the Premier and the Minister of Education have flip flopped on their commitment to cap class sizes. I don't understand why the Minister of Education is perplexed about why, about why job action is happening. Will the Premier admit that this government's reckless cuts are making a mess of our education system? And, and I think we need a little bit of clarity here. Um, the, 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 uh, the caps that she's talking about, the class size caps, are in fact contained in the local collective agreements. There ha that, that isn't uh, what we would necessarily be talking about at the, at the central table. The issue is around the local caps that are in local collective agreements. And I must say that um, as somebody who is a trustee, for years and years and years and years, and who actually have sat on a staffing allocation committee at secondary, that caps uh, often apply in the case of tech classes. They often apply in the cases of uh, other courses where there's health and safety, where there's an issue in a science Answer. lab around the maximum number of seats in a lab. So there's lots of caps that are very, very helpful, and I support those. Thank you. What isn't very helpful is when... Thank you. Supplementary. The fact is that you're actually increasing those caps. We know that central talks have broken down with secondary teachers, forcing tens of thousands of students out of schools. The minister has repeated over and over that these are local issues. We've also heard that she admits that she bears the responsibility of the central negotiating table. 73,000 elementary teachers will be in a legal strike position on Monday, affecting over 800,000 students across the province who are worried that they're going to lose their school year. It's clear it's not just a local uh, issue, Minister. Speaker, will the Premier stop dodging the responsibility and admit Liberals are throwing schools into chaos, forcing students, teachers and parents to pay the price? Minister? Yes, uh, I, I'm always fascinated to learn from the opposition what apparently it is that I'm trying to negotiate. It's really quite entertaining. Uh, it, it's quite interesting to find out what it is that I am or am and not doing. But what I do want to say is obviously we are quite concerned about the uh, situation with the elementary teachers. Once again, Member from Hamilton East, Stony Creek. we need to get back to the bargaining table. We need to we need to negotiate a settlement because we too want to avoid strikes. Thank you. Thank you. Your question, the member from Lakeshore. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this week marks North American Occupational Safety and Health Week, and it also happens to be the time of year where many young Ontarians uh, go out and get their first job and work over the summer. In my riding of Etobicoke Lakeshore, hundreds of Humber College students are completing their semester, and they're eager to go out, start their summer job, working in retail, in restaurants, on construction sites, wherever they found employment, and get that first paycheck. Mr. Speaker, these new and young workers are often inexperienced, and they're very eager to please their employers and get that paycheck in their hands. However, Mr. Speaker, it's troubling that statistics show that young people are three times more likely to be injured in the first three months on the job than their more experienced colleagues. Through you to the minister, Question. what can we do to ensure that our youngest and least experienced Ontarians are safe at work? Thank you, Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from uh, Etobicoke Lakeshore for what I think is an excellent question. We're always saddened in this House when we hear about workplace injuries, fatalities, our sincere condolences go out to those families that have been affected in this way. Most often, the sad part is, Speaker, these incidents that lead to the injury or the death are preventable or avoidable. It's something we need to do something about. We launched our annual New and Young Worker Health and Safety Blitz earlier this month to ensure that employers in this province and new employees alike understand the rights they have and the obligations they have under the law. But, Speaker, today what I'm appealing to members of this House is as parents and grandparents, as well as elected officials. Please talk to the young people that you have an impact on. We need everyone to play a role in keeping workplaces in Ontario yes, safe and make sure that these people make safety a habit throughout their entire career. Thank you. I want to thank the minister for that answer. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it's encouraging to know that ministry staff are proactively inspecting workplaces that employ new and young workers during their annual safety blitz. I think it's important to show our young people that this government cares about their well-being. But, Mr. Speaker, it's just not feasible to expect ministry staff to make it out to each and every uh, workplace. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the tagline for North American Occupational Safe Safety and Health Week is make safety a habit throughout the, your career. Speaker, through you to the minister, what is the government doing to ensure that all new and young workers have an understanding of their basic health and safety rights so they can begin to forge those safety habits earlier in their working life? Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Thank you again, Speaker, and thank you for the uh, supplementary. I want to reiterate that this government takes worker health and safety very, very seriously. It's a top priority. It's important that new and young workers in this province understand the fact that under the law, if they're asked to do something that they feel unsafe, they have the right to refuse to do that till they get more information, till they get more experience, till they learn about what they're being asked to do. We need to know, they need to know that they have that right as an Ontarian without any fear of reprisal if they're feeling like they're being put in an unsafe situation. We brought in a new regulation, Speaker, that requires all workers and supervisors in Ontario to complete basic entry-level health and safety. What it does is it outlines the duties they have, the responsibilities they have, because we know that there's a shared responsibility for workplace safety. On completion of the training, these workers have a basic understanding that I think is going to serve them well Thank you. in their career. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Your your question, the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the uh, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Oh, yeah. Minister, my constituent, Mr. Jim Lees, is waiting for a long-term care bed. While he waits, the Community Care Access Centre moved Mr. Lees from the hospital to a retirement home that even the CCAC has noted is not the right facility for him. Not to mention, the family has paid over $14,000 for six weeks of care so far in that facility. On Friday, the CCAC finally agreed to provide personal support care until a nursing home is found, but that still doesn't solve the problem, and it leaves the family paying thousands of dollars more a month than they would if Mr. Lees was in a nursing home. Minister, Mr. Lees is not alone. This is a problem right across Ontario, and yet your government continues to do nothing about it. Question. Will you help Mr. Lees, or is this yet another example of the health care system we can expect from this government? Welcome to Canada. 
Minister of Health, to the Associate Minister of Health. Associate Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to begin by thanking the member opposite for bringing his constituents' concern to my attention. I also want to offer my sympathies to the family, and uh, I also want to say to the minister that, as he knows, I cannot speak to the specifics of any individual case, but I'm happy to talk with you outside and after question period about the issue. I also know that my staff has been in touch, and as you mentioned, CCAC is providing some of the care that the constituent is looking for. But what I can do is reassure the member that in every circumstance where an Ontarian needs urgent care or placement in a long-term care home, these individuals are placed in the highest priority category for that placement. And the member knows that we are investing strongly in the long-term care sector. In fact, Mr. Speaker, and, in this year's budget funding for resident care needs all right, I'll have all three of you by then. an additional 2 percent. This builds on substantial funding increases our government has made in long-term care Thank you. funding for long-term care. I'll address the Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, back to the minister. Minister, the problem is, and you've not addressed it in your response, you haven't built a new nursing home bed, long-term care bed, in the last 12 years in this province. We built 20,000 during the eight years that we were in office. You haven't, you haven't put out one new license for one new bed. It's a crisis out there. Not everyone can stay at home. In this case, Mr. Lees gets kicked out of the hospital and put into a retirement home. They can't look after him. They can't meet his needs. So you're not doing anything about it. We've contacted your office for weeks and weeks and weeks now, and I've written four letters on this. He'll spend another $4,000 that the family can't afford just in the next month alone. When are you going to build some new beds, alleviate here, here. the problem out there right across the province? Mr. Lees is just one. You're going to bankrupt this family. You're killing them emotionally. This is a seniors couple that grew up in Canada expecting the care Question. that they should get in Canada and in Ontario. And you're failing them miserably. Thank you. Thank you. Associate Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, I'd like to uh, remind the member that I can't speak to the specifics of this case, but I want to reassure him that in every case where urgent placement is required for long-term care residents, that does take place, and CCAC works very hard. I also want to point out, Mr. Speaker, that wait times for long-term care homes has actually decreased from 190 days in 2008-2009 down to 116 days in 2013-14. And Mr. Speaker, my goal and this government's goal is to continue to drive investments into long-term care homes. And Mr. Speaker, as wrap up, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I was saying, we continue to invest in long-term care homes, but we also continue to invest in the continuum of care, Answer. as shown by the 5% increase in community care. And I look forward to working with the member opposite, and I'm committed to making sure Thank that you. seniors who receive long-term care. New question, the member from Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Uh, Speaker, members of QP paramedics are here today to once again draw attention, in fact, to seek help from the lawmakers in this chamber for the post-traumatic stress disorders their members experience on the job. We're only too happy to acknowledge the work they do, just not the toll that work can take on them. For eight years, we've asked, and again last week for First Responders Day, for this government to take action. So, Speaker. Once again, I ask the Premier, will you make PTSD a presumed workplace injury for first responders experiencing PTSD? Thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member from Parkdale High Park for the courtesy she's extended me on this, uh, on this very important issue, the interest she's shown and the, uh, the advocacy that she brings to this issue. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank CUPE and uh, the paramedics who are here with us today for the excellent breakfast this morning. Uh, and they, Speaker, they gave a very, very clear presentation on the, on the importance on, uh, of PTSD, on the importance of moving ahead on this issue. Uh, I'm pleased to report that uh, there are a number of people in Ontario 
that are weighing into this debate and weighing into this issue, asking this government to do more than it's doing, asking the WSIB to do more than it's doing. I'm, uh, I'm extremely interested in this issue, extremely interested in working with the member from Parkdale High Park. I think this is an issue that all Ontarians yes, think we owe the people that put their lives on the line every day. We owe them better on the PTSD Thank you. issue, Speaker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, to the Premier, it's not hard to figure out what needs to be done. For eight years, I emphasize that, Mr. Speaker, eight years, there's been legislation introduced that would recognize PTSD as a workplace injury for first responders in WSIB coverage. That's what our first responders are asking for. The bill for the breakfast is due. When we call 911, we expect first responders to be at our door in minutes. Yet when they need help, we wait years to answer their call. While this government has dithered, 17 first responders have killed themselves. How many more have to die? Speaker again, the answer to the question is a simple one. Will the minister question. act today to have PTSD recognized in WSIB legislation for first responders? Thank you. You say it, please. You say it, please. Thank you. Minister of Labour. Thank you, uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Parkdale High Park for the supplementary. Today, the current situation is that the WSIB provides compensation for people who suffer traumatic mental stress, where there's a clear link between one acute incident or a series of acute incidents at work or because of illness, injury or illness, what the member is asking for is an improvement to that system. It's one we take very, very seriously. What people have told us, including QP and the paramedics and the first responders, is that things are done differently in British Columbia, things are done differently in Alberta. What we have done is sent people out to those provinces. We've taken a very good examination of how it's done in the other provinces to see if that should apply to the province of Ontario. We're, uh, we're, we're very close to, I think, the end of that research, Speaker, where I will be able to bring some information back to my and colleagues sir. in the House. But once again, we're committed to this issue. We believe we can do better. I think all members of this House would agree with that as well. Thank you. Question to member from Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister responsible for women's issues. Every May, People in Ontario recognize Sexual Assault Prevention Month. It's a way of bringing awareness to the devastating effects of sexual violence. Around the world, we are seeing societies acting on the momentum for change and the need for the violence to end. People want to see action to stop sexual violence, and we need to support the survivors. They want this issue brought out of the shadows so that the old attitudes and stereotypes are eliminated. Mr. Speaker, for Sexual Assault Prevention Month, can the minister please inform this House what Ontario is doing to stop sexual violence? Do the minister responsible for women's issues. Thank you, Speaker. And first, I'd like to acknowledge the hard work of the member from Kitchener Centre as the chair of the Select Committee on Sexual Violence and Harassment, and all the members who are on that committee. Thank you. Thank you. And as the member said, Speaker, it is Sexual Assault Prevention Month, and this gives a tremendous opportunity to teachers, nurses and doctors, sexual assault centres and women's shelters, all advocates and many more to inform others of services for victims. And they dispel myths, Speaker, myths surrounding sexual assault and bring a focus on how important it is to end sexual violence and harassment. And I'm very proud that this year our government is joining with them in our bold action plan to stop sexual violence and harassment. It's called It's Never Okay. And our provocative new ad asking everyday bystanders. Answer. It's called Who Will You Help? challenges the myth that sexual assault is not your business. Mr. Speaker, it is absolutely everybody's business. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. 
Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the minister for her answer. It's so important to see that we are recognizing such a very pervasive problem in our society, and we're addressing it head on, and that is leadership that people in Ontario can count on. Uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I'm also glad to hear that there will be additional investments in sexual assault centres across the province, and as the minister mentioned, as the chair of the Select Committee on Sexual Violence and Harassment, we're certainly hearing that from the presenters who are appearing before us. Uh, supporting those who are on the front lines, helping both female and male victims of sexual violence, is going to mean that survivors can get the care and the attention that they need, and that is what they are telling us they need and want. Mr. Speaker, could the minister please highlight other ways that our government is confronting sexual Question. violence with its action plan? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, we have over 42 sexual assault centres across this work, and I'm very proud that our Premier and Minister Jeff Leal marked the start of Sexual Assault Prevention Month just uh, last week at the Kawartha Lake Sexual Assault uh, Centre. And Speaker, we know that sexual violence is a societal issue that's been with us far too long. And if we only focus on deterrence, Speaker, we won't see the generational change that's needed to end sexual violence in Ontario. That's why, under our $41 million action plan to stop sexual violence and harassment, we focus on teaching our next generation about consent and healthy relationships. This is a very forward-looking effort, Speaker, that will teach respectful behaviours and we hope will have a lasting effect on Answer. the safety and security of all of our citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you. The question is from Yeah. <clears throat> A question to the Premier. I've received an urgent call from a plant manager in my riding. He has to compete with U.S. industry paying three cents a kilowatt hour, and he predicts unless something changes, his plant will close in two years. He also tells me if uh, nothing changes, other businesses will head south. These are examples from just one town in my riding. One of the basic principles of business is to make a profit. But Ontario now has the highest electricity rates in North America. Businesses cannot afford these rates. Why will you not change your hydro policy to encourage not only this small company, but other companies to remain in the Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, uh, I appreciate the question. And, uh, uh, the first part of my response is to, uh, to indicate to the member I'll be happy to meet or have my staff meet uh, with this particular business person. Um, and uh, as you may be aware, I've, I've arranged meetings with other uh, members of your caucus, uh, and we've been able to uh, introduce uh, business people to the programs that we do have, uh, which, uh, which can be very helpful. Uh, they range from the uh, industrial uh, electricity uh, incentive program, Mr. Speaker, uh, for those who are new or expanding. The ICI program, Mr. Speaker, can reduce up to 25 per cent. And, Mr. Speaker, all of the LDCs across the province uh, have uh, conservation programs uh, which enable very, very significant savings. Uh, and uh, there are programs to help fund Answer. those, those, uh, those initiatives. Uh, we have Home Depot, Canadian Tire Centre uh, in Ottawa, uh, Tim Hortons, Mr. Thank Speaker, uh, across the province. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. It's not helping down my way. In Haldeman, Caledonia, over nine years, this government has destroyed. Our home building economy in yep. Norfolk, you've destroyed much of our legal tobacco industry, yep. you've destroyed OPG yep. Nanico, and, and you've again. tripled the top end cost of electricity, 16 cents a kilowatt hour. When we were in government, it was 4.3. My local companies, they're being lured no by North Carolina, yep. they're being yep. induced yep. by uh, Michigan, Ohio, New York State. Yep. All these inducements are on the table. They come and visit. I've heard this from a number of companies, even before the latest electricity hike. Now it's accelerated. And again, all of this just in my writing. Premier, why will you not consider a dramatic reversal of your disastrous electricity policy? Thank you. Thank you. 
Minister of Energy. Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Minister of Economic Development. Mr. Speaker, I wanted to help out here by giving the member an idea of how he can help businesses like that particular business and businesses right across this province. What that member can do is support our budget, Mr. Speaker. Our budget that for businesses like that are extending for 10 years the number one program that our business community asked, and that's to provide them with incentives to invest in capital, to invest in upgrading their machinery, invest in their buildings. He can support our budget, Mr. Speaker, that's providing $130 billion over the next— It is never too late to have somebody named. Finish, please. Speaker, the member could support our budget that's going to be investing $130 billion over the next 10 years, supporting 110 to 115,000 jobs every year. And he should have, and maybe he can go back on this, he should have supported the Southwestern Ontario Development Fund that's creating tens Thank of you. thousands of jobs in Southwestern Ontario. In the uh, East Members Gallery from uh, the riding of Halliburton Cortha Lakes Brock in the 39th Parliament. We have Mr. Rick Johnson visiting. The member from Simcoe North on a point of order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to correction what I might have said to the Minister of Education earlier. I believe I said it is highly unlikely that 870. 870 elementary students. I should have said it's highly likely. That's what I meant. Thank you. Thank you. The Minister of Finance. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I beg your indulgence. I have an important constituent who just recently arrived in this house. Please welcome to the legislature my youngest daughter, Jessica, who is, a, who is in the members' gallery. Welcome to this house. Thank you. I'd like to welcome Fraser Davidson, Karthik uh, Ramanathan, and Prat Yusha Mohan, who are visiting us from the United Kingdom today. I would also like to welcome the mother and father of uh, my page, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Tawari. Thank you. Ottawa, Orlean. Come in the legislature. Two of my constituents of Ottawa Orleans who are here today with the Paramedic Association, and I would like to welcome Andrew Phillips and Norm Robillard. Welcome. Thank you, Minister of Agriculture. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in the members east gallery today, I'd like to introduce my intern, a native from uh, Coburg, Ontario, Dan Gasato, who will be working with me uh, over the next uh, months ahead. Thank you. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.